Hello, young scholars. This is Mr. Martyrone with part two of the French Revolution. You should look in your notes. This is part two. The revolution unfolds. And in this episode, we're going to talk about creating a new France. So in our previous class, we talked about the troubles facing France and the French people. We talked about uh, the disparity between the the first estate and the third estate and the rise of the bourgeoisie. And we talked about how, how all these events came to a head on July 14, 1789 on Bastille Day. The big difference, a lot of people like to compare the American Revolution to the French Revolution. The problem is the American Revolution, the Americans had a system of government in place under the Articles of Confederation prior to separation. They knew what they were going to be replacing the monarch with. The French did not have that. They tried to overthrow the king without having a government in order to replace them. So what we see happen in this part of the French Revolution is this is clearly Montesquieu – or excuse me, this is clearly Locke and Hobbes' scenarios playing out. On the one hand, Locke believing in natural rights and people overthrowing the government. We saw that in the rise of the Bastille. But then we also have Locke's point of view come true when he says, well, people aren't governing themselves, and in fact the country erupts into chaos and anarchy. So let's take a look. What was Paris like in the summer of 1789? So Paris was a hotbed of revolutionary activity, and there were something called factions or small groups that competed for power. So without a central figure, authority figure, a king, he was under house arrest, um, they didn't know who was going to govern. So the National Guard is formed, and this is a moderate group led by the Marquis de Lafayette. And they're a middle class group of people. They're, they're not advocating one violent overthrow or another, but they are the first to wear the tricolor flag, which is uh, blue, white, and red. A lot of people think that it's red, white, and blue, like uh, America, but it's not. It's blue, white, and red. So some of the moderates in the French Revolution, they don't want a complete overhaul. They don't want to see the country get rid of its king altogether. So what do they do? Well, in August, about a little less than a month after the storming of the Bastille, they vote to end special privileges. So now the nobles and the National Assembly end their special privileges. They no longer vote as one estate, and now um, they no longer have the tax exemption and their special legal status. And also they agree to the Declaration of Rights of Man, which says that all men are created equal. And this is an important moment, and we talked about this in previous classes with the Enlightenment, but the Declaration of Rights of Man. The Declaration of Rights of Man was written in part by Thomas Jefferson. It was modeled after the Declaration of Independence, and it said, number one, that all Frenchmen were born and remain free in equal in rights. So very similar to the Declaration, very similar to what John Locke argued. And number two that they enjoy the natural rights of liberty, property, security, and the resistance to oppression. And I think we went over this in our previous DBQ. The Declaration of Rights of Man also says that all male citizens are equal before the law. They can hold public office and have freedom of religion. And taxes are to be levied according to ability to pay. So we saw in our first class that the taxes were unfavorably uh, pressed down upon the uh, third estate, the bourgeoisie, the urban poor. Now they are calling for a redistribution of wealth, and we'll see this phrase come to fruition um, in the next chapter when we deal with you know, the Industrial Revolution and communism in the 1900s. So a new government is formed called the National Assembly, All right, and a couple of changes that they make. Well, number one, the church. The assembly, uh, they agree to pay off the debts, and they sell off church's land. So again, another – we're now out of the Renaissance, but still the power of the church has just been eviscerated and cut down and auctioned off. Now there is a civil constitution of the clergy. That's 1790. And they put the French Catholics under church uh, – it's now going to be under state control. 
So that's no longer really part of the Vatican. Bishops and priests become elected, and they become salaried official. And really, the French Revolution ends uh, papal authority over the French church. Um, converts and monasteries are dissolved, so they're trying to do away with religion. And also under the National Assembly, the government, they set up a limited monarchy like they have in England at this point. So now the new legislative assembly has the power to make laws, collect taxes, decide on issues of war and peace, and the lawmakers um, have to be elected by taxpaying male citizens. So women, unfortunately, don't have the right to vote at this point. That's not going to come until the end of the 19th century in Europe, uh, beginning of the 20th century for the United States. Uh, women are still excluded there. Um, and other laws, uh, the old court system was abolished. Pri the protections of private property uh, were eliminated. Free trade, uh, unions were abolished. Um, so really, the National Assembly tried to steer a middle course, but in doing so, you know, it's the old saying, if you walk in the middle of the road, you're definitely going to get hit by a car. So they try and steer this middle course, but ultimately it proves to be or unsuccessful. So seeing that he is in trouble, there's little Louis. King Louis the Fourteenth, as we know, he's not a good commander. He's not decisive. He's very indecisive, and he he fears a, a, a he fears for his life. So by nineteen by seventeen ninety one, Louis leaves France. He and Marie Antoinette um, they disguise and they attempt to leave France. And they're going to go back to uh, Austria, which is where Marie Antoinette's from. Now, why this is a problem is that many people believe that Louis was trying to link up with Marie Antoinette's family. And in doing so, he then would have been able to launch an army to invade his own country. For this, he will be arrested. And as he is escaping, he is – someone recognizes his face, believe it or not. They recognize him on currency, and they arrest him. The, they arrest him and they try him for treason uh, because it's a going against his own country. So now we have a situation where the moderates are gaining control. The king is under arrest. Events are beginning to spiral out of control. So now by this point, there's widespread fears of, um, of uh, disaster. And the European rulers increase border protection um, and – because other countries next to France, they don't want this problem. Um, and now we get to uh, two terms, what are called émergés, and these are people who are trying to flee France. Think of the word émigrant or émigrate. Um, they're nobles and clergy who are trying to get the heck out of France because they don't like what's happening to it. Just there's revolutions and chaos breaking up all over the country again. Think about what Hobbes says. If you don't have a strong monarch to protect your people, the world is going to go crazy, and that's what's happening in France. But now, 1791, uh, the Prussian army is getting ready to invade from the west – excuse me, from the east. So now France is in the midst of almost a civil war while potentially fighting a war on its borders. And that all was, uh, by the way, the answer for number five, if you will. Uh, that was a, quite a bit of background. But now on to number six, uh, the internal conflicts, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in class. Um, there are two groups that emerge from this, this uh, divisions. Uh, one group is called the Sans Culottes, and the others are called the Jacobins. All right, uh, the Sans Culottes. Are if you guys can see this picture, they're the knee bridges. Kind of, you know how when you think of George Washington or John Adams or John Hancock or Jefferson, you know the culotte is like the leg piece. Well, now to show, um, to show uh, solidarity for the French Revolution, men will now wear long pants. So notice the style that this changes, and eventually what we see by the early 1800s, by 1810, 1812, the culotte. Uh, that style of knee bridges is no longer fashionable. So the sans culottes are people without the culottes, and the Jacobins are a radical legislative group 
Uh, they support uh, Maximilian Robespierre. We'll talk about him in class. These are usually uh, middle class lawyers and intellectuals uh, who are rallying against the, the French Revolution. And these opposed uh, these radicals were opposing the moderate reforms and and everything that was happening. We're going to talk a little bit about. Well, actually, we're going to talk a lot about um, the political divisions within uh, France. And we're also going to talk about, you know, what is a conservative, what is a moderate, what is a liberal, because uh, these are terms that we still use today. All right, the war on tyranny. Uh, the radicals uh, take control of the assembly in 1792. Um, and they threaten war on Austria and Prussia, um, and now this war in be, really reigns between 1792 and 1850. So Europe is in a state of chaos as a result of the French Revolution. All right. Uh, if you need to watch this video again, please feel free to do so. Uh, if I went too fast for you, you know, just go back, pause, make sure you get the notes for part two: the revolution unfolds 1789 to 1791.